Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Creating the Vision, where we are going to talk money, purpose, power, and relationships, our relationship with money, everything with the fantastic, dynamic, and amazing Richard Wu. I was honored to be on his podcast, uh, The Power of Connections, which you guys have to check out last month or maybe a couple months ago. <laughs> Our dead time is getting away from us. But Rich and I connected, hit it off, and we're like, yes, let's do this. I want to have this conversation because what he does is so important to so many of my listeners and really all of us because he works with money. He currently serves as founder and wealth advisor at Catalyst planning partners where he and his team advise on over 600 million of client assets. His mission in life, which I love that he started with his mission because y'all know I love a good mission. Uh, his mission in life is to love and serve God, family, friends, clients, community, and the multi-generations of people that he will never see or meet <laughs> and thereby make an impact on this world. I love it. And he's going to make a great impact because he has a book coming out as well, which we're going to touch on called The Relationship Recession. And it's focused on the loneliness epidemic, sorry, and practical ways to rebuild friendships and deepen them over time. Welcome, Rich. So excited to have you. Maria, thank you so much for having me as a guest. I'm honored and I love spending time and connecting with you. So thank you. Yes, I enjoyed our time so much together on your podcast. We talked about this, the power of connections, and there's so much alignment and synergy with what you and I both do, yet we're in two totally different spaces. That's right. That's right. Well, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really excited because I think a lot of the work that you do, and especially with the demographic of people that you're serving and focused on is so important. And, you know, obviously the topic of money is a, is, is, is something that's integral to everybody that we interact with. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, they always talk about like, you know, without health, you don't have anything, but, you know, health with, I wouldn't say necessarily wealth, but without means is also not a fun place to be in. So money is a very, very important topic, often misunderstood, often something that's feared, but a very important topic to to discuss and dive into. Yes, I'm so excited to get into it. And and I, I think first, I want to back up a little bit. I mean, I love that you started with your mission. We've talked about this, but I think, you know, tell us a little bit about kind of what led you to working with wealth and advising. Cause like you said, I mean, this is, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because it's coming up. It's being, it's so prevalent. I feel like amongst, you know, just society in general, but women especially are becoming more and more concerned is the word that comes to mind, but I think it's just more, more in tune with their money, their money situation, their money, their conversation with money, their, their relationship with money. How did you kind of get to where you are now? with working with over 600 million of clients' assets? Yeah, a great question. So coming out of college, I worked in corporate finance, you know, went to a career fair, found a decent job and, you know, did that for a couple of years. I think there was a part of me in those years uh, that I just felt like I, I was dying inside. It was, it was a good first job. I got a lot of experience, but I just knew in my heart it wasn't for me. And I kind of stumbled upon an opportunity when I was about 27, 28 to look at the wealth advisory financial planning space. And I didn't really know much about it. Quite frankly, like I didn't, I didn't have my personal finances in order. And I was like, yeah, this is like kind of important work. Uh, I also thought it was, it'd be really interesting to explore because, you know, I'm, I'm a numbers guy, I'm a finance math guy, but I, I'm also a people person. And to me, it was appealing because it was like, oh, you get to work with like numbers and finance and people. But I think the thing that eventually kind of pushed me over the ledge to make a big transition, giving up like a pretty stable, good job in corporate finance was uh, the fact that when I was in high school, and I had mentioned this to you before, my mom passed away in a, a tragic accident. My mom, my dad, and my brother went on a white water rafting trip and just in a freak accident, she ended up drowning. And so we lost her very, very suddenly. And I think that experience at a young age, I was 15 then, and then thinking forward when I was in my late 20s, made me think, wow, if I can do work that involves helping people get to a place where they have some peace of mind and some stability in their finances where they otherwise wouldn't have, because that's the position that we were in. We didn't have any financial help. We probably had some a little bit of money stuffed under a mattress, but like we didn't have any help. And I was like, wow, if I could help people 
whether they're in a good situation or a bad situation, just get a little bit more peace of mind around their finances and where they're headed. I just felt at my core, given my story and just the things I'd experienced in life, it's like I, that's that's meaningful work to me. That's not just getting paid and that's not just doing a job just because you need a job. But that to me felt like it was significant and something I could look back at the end of my life and say, wow, like I actually did really meaningful work. So that was the start of my journey when I was 28. You know, I'm 43 now, so I've been doing that 15, almost 16 years now. And I've never looked back. It's been an incredible journey. I love the work that I do. I love the people that we work with. I love the ways that we get to engage with clients and help them in their journey and provide clarity. But that's kind of that. That was the start of the journey. I love how you have taken that what happened kind of to you, you know, that you couldn't control in that situation, um, but used it as a force to show up in the world and have this massive purpose to help people. And I think that interesting um, point, it's something interesting that's coming up too, is like the comfortability. So like with money, like getting comfortable with just kind of having this conversation around money, because yes, I mean, you said earlier health and wealth, but, but means, but we have to, you know, feed and clothe our kids. Like I have to pay bills. I have to put a roof over my head. You know, I have to help support my family. And so while I love doing what I do and I love like donating of my time and volunteering and all of those things, like it, it kind of, when you start to realize like money's not a bad thing, you know, so making our purpose like aligned with helping people also understand that it's something that we all need. It, it, it is a commodity. It's a resource that we all absolutely have to have in order to function in our everyday life. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's, I think as you say that it kind of makes me think money is neutral. It's a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. It's a number in a bank account. Mm -hmm. It's a neutral thing. Yeah. Uh, I think as I've talked to thousands of people over the years, I've, I've actually learned a lot about money and what it means to people and how to think about it. I think it means a lot of different things. I think for a lot of people, it means flexibility. It means the ability to have options and not just relegate it to just like one set of things that you can do. I think it, for some people, it provides security. I think for others on the other end of the spectrum, it provides possibility. Like what could I have happen, you know, because I have some more, you know, I also think it's a, I think it's a reflection of what's in people's hearts. You know, some people say, oh, you got a lot of money, you're greedy. Well, I don't know. What if that person's really generous with their money? Are they greedy? On the other hand, you can have very little. And also, you know, people could think, oh, well, you must, you must have given it all away or generous. I don't know. So I know some people who have very little and are very like, hey, what's mine is why mine. I can't give to anybody. I don't have anything for anybody else. And so, Again, I think money's a neutral thing. I think it's a, a means to, to different avenues of life. And I also think it's a reflection of what's inside of your life. How would you advise or start the conversation with someone who maybe has a relationship with or doesn't have a relationship with money is actually starting, you know, trying to form a relationship with it? Yeah, I think any good exploration or endeavor starts with asking good questions. So I think it starts with what you're talking about. Like, what's your relationship been with money if you if you have one and i think mm -hmm. people take it in one of two ways either one there's kind of pain or fear or some anxiety around money so a lot of like negative emotions or and for a, a lot fewer people there's excitement there's possibility there's dreams there's hopes there's vision i would say on average the larger percentage probably has you know probably is reflected in the majority where they talk about the anxiety and the fear but I think first it's to explore, you know, what what their experience has been with money and, you know, what camp they're in. And then from there, it's then understanding, OK, it's less about like, again, I think when we're talking finances with people, people think they want to start with the tactics instead of the vision. So what I mean by that, it's like a lot of people approach money and, and thinking about. So, for example, if you go to the doctors, you don't just walk into the doctor's office. Doctor comes in, you don't say, well okay, hey, I, I need some Tylenol. Can you give me a shot? And like, how about like, maybe you, you, you check out my neck and my ear. You would let, you know, the doctor maybe ask you some questions. You would talk about the things that are important to you, what you want as a part of your health. And then the doctor and you would then come up with a plan and like a strategy as to how to execute that. Maybe there's no pills involved. Maybe there's no shots involved. Maybe it's a change in the diet. And I think much in the same way, money 
and, and the idea of finances needs to be treated as such before you start getting into the 401k or the CD or the cryptocurrency. It's like, well, what do you, what do you want in life? Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of the people that we talk to, as we kind of approach them in that way, you know, a lot of amazing things come out and, you know, whether it's, I want to take care of my kids. I want to be financially independent. I don't have to worry about money anymore. I, I want to make sure something bad happens that my family's going to be okay. These are really the true goals. People's goals aren't, I need just a million dollars in the corner so I can just look at it and know that I have a lot of money. That's not, no one's goal is actually that. The goal is, well, I need some money and I need investments and things like that because it then it allows me to take care of my family. It allows me to do the things that I'm really passionate about. And so I think if you start with the goals and the clarity around that first, all the strategy, all that stuff can follow. You can figure that part out. The harder part is settling down, figuring out what you want out of life, and then coming up with the strategies after the fact. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And I, I, I love everything that you, your process and how you engage, because I think our money story is so powerful. And I think a lot of how we grew up, if we were, you know, amongst a lot of, you know, if we, if we were in an environment where like we, we didn't have any concern or anxiety or stress around money. Like it was something that, you know, it was just kind of always there. You had whatever you needed, whatever you wanted. Like if you wanted something, like you got it, like, great, you know? So then, you know, you grow up and then you get out into the world and you're like, well, I mean, like, yeah, I just, if I want it, I, I go get it, you know? So like your, your attachment to money is maybe a different picture as opposed to someone who maybe grew up like really understanding sure. that their family struggled for every single, you know, penny or every single thing. I mean, I always our kids sometimes I think they're like, they're like, are we broke or something? Because we do, we do try to, we do try to paint the picture to them that like things cost money, things, you know, we, we just because we might want a new dress or just because we might want a new, you know, fun toy, like we don't just go out and get it. Like it's, it's let's budget for it. Let's outline, you know, do we have the, the way, you know, do we have the way to pay for it right now? We're not putting it on credit, et cetera. But those are, those are honestly, stories and I don't see the stories, but those are, those are habits that we have instilled because I think my husband and I had very different situations growing up around mm -hmm. money. And mm -hmm. so because we are, are now, you know, coming together collectively, it's like very fortunate that, you know, I married someone who is very good with money, like always had, had that, you know, both my parents were very hardworking, but struggled kind of to your point, like didn't really have that safety net if anything happened, kind of like the one paycheck away from a catastrophic, you know, yeah. an event and just, you know, thank God, you know, we were never in that situation, but I know it was a struggle for them. And so I think I grew up with that attachment to like always like hustling and just like trying to stay ahead mm -hmm. out of fear that like, what if something happens? Like, am I going to be prepared? And so if it's like, if you're telling me I need six months, like in my mind, I need like two years because I'm, you know, of savings. Cause I'm just like that freaked out about, about money. And yeah, so I think it, it's great to have those conversations. And unfortunately, this is kind of what we were talking about on your podcast. Like we don't teach, we don't teach our kids these practical things. Like we don't teach them yeah. these kinds of steps. We don't teach them to have a relationship with money that's healthy. And, and promoting that healthiness from the from the get go. That's right. That's right. Well, I, I was at, at a dinner with a friend probably about a year ago, and we were just sharing about like our children and some of the best things that we've done in parenting. Obviously, there are a lot of mistakes, but like some of the best things that we've done in parenting. And I, I thought it was interesting something that he said. He said, the best thing that I did for all of my children, I think he has four children, was at the age of eight, I set all of my kids up with a bank account. And we would give them some money for chores and, you know, just kind of an allowance on a monthly basis. And so when we would go to, you know, a, a family trip, you know, they, they would get fed, they'd get breakfast, lunch and dinner, they would have housing. But if they wanted an extra treat, if they wanted an extra soda, if they wanted an extra ice cream beyond what, you know, mom and dad was, you know, were providing them, they had the option to get it. They just had to go into their own bank account to do it. And so I think... Obviously, in a perfect world, you, you know, you, you instill a great framework around savings and investing and all these things in your children at a young age. But a lot of people aren't necessarily equipped to do that. And it's hard. And, and so, look, if you can do it, awesome. But I think a, a great way to have children learn and teach themselves about money is just empowering them, saying, look, you've got a certain amount of money. You've got a bunch of wants and desires. You have to make those choices. 
And so instead of him having to sit, oh, let me give you a lesson every day about money, the kids were teaching themselves. Every time they went to the toy store, they saw the ice cream shop, they went to sit down at a restaurant, they went to you know, Target, they had to make a calculation in their head. I've got 20 bucks. Do I want to use a quarter of that to buy like this little figurine or doll? So I think that's, you know, something that as I have young kids, you know, obviously you have children too, but like, you know, I have a four and a two year old. I think about that, you know, as they get a little bit older, I'm going to, I'm going to institute that in our household to give them the, the opportunity to learn and build that habit and that, and that mode of thinking for themselves. Yeah. I love the empowerment piece. Oh, I, I really, really love that you mentioned the empowerment piece because it is. And I think as women in business, women entrepreneurs, that's also a piece that if, gosh, I just think if that had that empowerment from such a young age, like how much more equipped I would be heading into my entrepreneurial journey too, because it's just, there's just That's a right. confidence there. You know, when you, when you have a hold and a handle of your finances and of your, your money story, then you can use it. Like you mentioned earlier as a vehicle to get things done. And you look at it from a different perspective as, as opposed to, you know, a different mindset that's always like in worry mode or in stress or anxiety mode. That's right. That's right. And again, you don't have to do it alone. Yeah. You don't have to do it alone. I mean, you can find a good financial advisor to help you in that journey. Again, I would, you know, talk to some different people and find a good fit there. Uh, There's also a lot of great books that are written. While I don't agree with everything in the book, there's, there's a good book for beginners, a book written by J.L. Collins, and it's called The Simple Path to Wealth. And essentially this guy, he just wrote a bunch of letters to his daughter. And the book is a compilation of those letters and the lessons that he wanted to teach his daughter about finance and planning. So I don't know if it was like intentionally written for like the masses, but people caught on to it, sold like millions of copies. And it's a good, like very beginner level of like, what are the steps that I need to take to, you know, to, to getting myself financially right. But I think you don't have to do it alone. I think that's, that's the good news. And I think so many people do because they're fearful about talking about money or they don't know where to start. And there's just a lot of great books and people out there that can help. Yeah. And okay. So speaking of books, actually perfect tip, because I want to talk about your book, your podcast is the power of connections and the book is the relationship recession, which is such a catchy title. I love that. And I Thank love you. how you, you told me a little bit about your process last time after our, the podcast, like how it kind of was pulled out of you. So That's I love right. that and the loneliness epidemic, but talk to us a little bit kind of as we shift, like where was the vision for this book? Like how did all this kind of come together? What a, what a great question. I, um, I think they, a couple years ago, I came to a, a place in my life where I was thinking about like, what, you know, I, I, I've kind of built my business and, and things are going well there. My family is, you know, set. We've got two little kids that are growing up. We're so excited. And so I was like, okay, well, how, what, what's kind of the next project that I want to be working on? And I kind of started my po- thought about starting my podcast and I was like, you know, I'd love to write a book. I don't know about what, but, you know, and so initially it was like, a, it was going to be a book about like, just like networking and business and relationships. Cause that's kind of, you know, the, the business that I'm in. But then I was like, you know, I don't know if that's like at, at my core, like what I am passionate about, right? I can write about it, but I'm like, is that something that I want my life? If I had one book that I wanted to be about. And I think at the core, it was like more rudimentary. It was about mm-hmm. relationships. That's, relationships have always been important to me. I think in part because, you know, I lost my mo- mother at an early age. So I know the the brevity of life and how you're not promised any relationships with your parents, with your kids, with your best friends tomorrow. You're not promised that. Uh, yet, I think a lot of us live under the illusion that like we have forever, like until we die and which is like 80 years away and we'll just, and I think those are false assumptions. I also, there was a there was a study that was done um, at Harvard, 1938, uh, the longest longitudinal study that was ever done, 90 years, still running, 800 people. They tracked 800 people over 90 years, and they were trying to figure out, like, what's what keeps these people happy and what's keeping these people living long? And they had a lot of different findings, but one of the core findings was the d- degree to which they had connected meaningful relationships would be able to help predict if they were going to live long, happy lives. You contrast that with the statistics today, more than 50% of Americans are dissatisfied with the level of their relationships. 57% of Americans report being lonely some or most of the time, 
we know that loneliness, uh, if someone who's lonely, lonely can have, it has the same effect of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And we know, hey, smoking 15 cigarettes a day is probably not good for your health. So how do you how do you solve for that? Why are people stuck here? We know relationship, deep, meaningful relationships make us happy. The stats are showing like that people are not living happy and long lives. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we make that change? And I think I think a lot of people want to make a change, but they're stuck. Mm -hmm. And so the book was like a collection of just practical ideas of like whether you're just stuck in your own head, whether you don't have any friends, or maybe you have some friends, but they all feel very shallow or superficial. Helping people in either any one of those stages, getting out of that part and progressing along to deep, meaningful, connected relationships. Because you know this, Maria, we've talked about this. Look, you, you can make money, you can have a great job, you can have a lot of success. But if you don't have happy relationships at home with your family, with your friends, none of that other stuff matters. Nobody goes you know, no one, no one at their, at their deathbed says, oh man, but I wish I just had another $2 million or $5 million. Like no one says that they do say, Hey, I wish I would have done different things differently with my spouse or my kids or my friends, or I don't even have any friends at this point. What happened? You know? So that's what the book is about. Practical suggestions. What do tell me what to do? And I will do it because I want better and more meaningful relationships. I love it. It's such a, yeah. Well, there's so many. I just, I'm, I'm so, I'm so glad that you're writing the book on this, and and that you're sharing that story because you're right. There's so many things. I was like, I, I, there's so many things I like want to touch on. One was time. Absolutely, yes. I love that you said that. Like, time is finite. You know, we only have so many of it. And I went down a rabbit hole with this after one of my most recent podcast episodes because I had shared the stat. I think Don Felker is the one who who said that. You know we spend 90% of our time with our parents by the time we're 18. I think it's like 75% mm -hmm. by the time we're 12. And then by the time we're 18, 90% of our time. And so then how that equates into days left with them is that we will spend on average one more year of our life in totality with our parents. And so I think like you, you know, like you were saying like time, you know, and that those, those relationships are so vital, like connectedness is so important and we have to connect with, with people. That's like what sustains us and the energy, you know, that's how we get, you know, that that's, yeah, no, no wonder why, you know, like you'd mentioned in the Harvard study, that just makes total sense. It makes total sense that we, we need that connection and time is our best friend. It's also our worst enemy, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's that gift that if we have it, like we got we gotta use it. Right. That's right. Yeah. And then I love the connection too, that you were kind of talking about. It really tied back into the wealth conversation or the, the conversation around, you know, money, because like you said, I mean, you're on your deathbed and you could have this mountain of money, but it doesn't really mean anything if you haven't been able to connect with or spend your, your life in the way that, that you want or that you've you know yeah. enriched yeah. your life with the people in it. That's right. Another book that I recently read that I feel like crystallized a lot of things that we already talk about with our clients as we talk about money and finances is a book by a guy named Bill Perkins, Die With Zero. So Bill is this interesting guy. He's like in his early 50s now. He was a energy trader. So like, you know, a stock trader, but he was dealing in kind of the energy space. And it, over a five-year period, he generated like a billion dollars of profits. So he made a lot of money in a very short mm -hmm. period of time. I think he got to a place where in his late forties, early fifties was like, okay, I don't like need to make any more money. What, what is my life about? So he ended up writing this book and I can give the, the premise of the book away. It's still definitely worth a read, but the whole idea with, of the book was like, live your life intentionally. It's not just about money. And so he kind of gives like the book is broken up into different parts, but he kind of gives this framework that says, look, if you have like, again, more than like you know, a little bit of money at the end of your life in your bank accounts, you probably made a mistake in one of three ways. One, you should have given more of that away while you were living to people that you cared about or causes that you cared about. Like point in case, if you care about, I don't know, people that are starving in other parts in the world, what good does it do to double your money and then give it to people 30 years from now? Why don't you give it to them now? Cause they're dying now. Right. Mm -hmm. Or like your kids, like you want to give them, an, you know, some money to get them started. And okay, they don't need your money when they're 80, 80 years old, when you pass away, they could use like the boost for the house or for their college or, or, you know, to start of a, to start a business when they're into their twenties or thirties, when, when they can actually use the money. So that's one. The second thing that he talks about is 
probably should have spent a little bit more money while you were still able to, right? How many people save, 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 and then they get to like 70 or 80 and then they're like, I can't actually even use this money anymore. And maybe I should have gone on that one extra vacation and enjoyed my life versus like waiting to save it 50 years from now. Obviously, it's important to save. I'm not telling people right. not to save, right. but like, right. you know what we're talking about, right? Yeah, like people who are so it. fearful. Yeah. And then the third thing that I, I think was interesting was you might have worked too hard. And how many people who are, you know, get some success, ride that momentum and that success and at 50 and 60 are still working 50, 60, 70 hours when they don't need to and they've lost those critical years with their kids. So you have all this extra money at the end, but like, Maybe you could have had a little less and more time with your family when it was more critical. So again, it's not a book about, well, just, you know, the book is interesting because Die With Zero makes you think like, just spend all your money now and live frivolously. Right. It's not that at all. It's actually just be thoughtful about how you're spending. You might, if you're, if you're not a good saver, you probably need to save. But if you're actually a good saver and you're saving money for the future, maybe you should think about what is that all for and how should I be using my resources and time now? So that's a lot of the stuff that we actually talk about with our clients, but I, I thought it was a very like poignant book to address some of the topics of money and how people think about it. Mm -hmm. And the intention behind it. I think that was the yeah, love that you pointed that out, just the, the, the intentionality with yeah. just know what you're doing with your money and why. And, yes. and, you know, why are you saving this? Why are you holding on to it? And could you take that trip now when you are yeah, young, able and you know, spirited, you know, to do it. What's the point of waiting another how many ever years and, and, and doing that now? Yeah, it's why I, and I know I share this with, with, you know, we've talked about this. I shared this with you. I mean, one of the number one goals that people set, you know, collectively across the board is health and wellness. Number two is financial freedom. You know, three is typically travel, four is route, like relationship driven. But when, when you think about those three, it's like when you've got your health, that's when you want to spend that money to take that trip. So it's like they're all three right there aligned. And I think it says so much about who we want to become. Mm -hmm. And then I think on the flip side, like, but who we actually are. Yeah. Because that, and, and that's kind of almost in creating that vision. I'm sure you, that's a lot of the work that you do is helping them not just create that, that vision for their wealth path or what they're working towards, but then helping them actually do, do it. 100%. Because in what you're talking about is the importance of timing. I'll give you an example of this. My dad's 75 and, you know, we were able to do a lot of great things, travel, taking a lot of places and experience life. I always thought he'd be able to travel and, 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 and go to a bunch of different places until he was 85. You know, I don't, I don't know about a hundred, but 85 certainly. And like recently I was like, Hey dad, you know, I want you to come see the kids in California. You know, he's in Chicago. And he was like, Hey, look, I, I, I would love to see your kids more than anything. I don't feel good about going on planes. And I was like, well, what, do you, what do you mean? Like, I'll, if you want, like, you want me to come and help you guys? He's like, I just, something about that is an unsettling feeling. And so here you're thinking, I don't know, you have, yeah, getting on a plane. I'm not asking you to climb Mount Everest. It's not, right. and you're thinking you have forever with your family to do whatever you want. And the reality is that is not true. My dad has come to a point where Unless we go see him, he's not going to be able to see the kids outside of like Zoom or FaceTime. And so why is that story important? That story is important because the timing of when you use your money and save your money is everything. There is a time and place to save your money, but there's also a time to use it. I'm like one of the few advisors that like tells people to spend their money. Like yeah. let's craft out a plan to spend your money when you can, because you don't want to get to a place where you're like, I'm saving, I'm saving. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And then you can't. And you got all the money, but there's no, you can't use it in the same way that you could have 10 years ago, you know? So it's really important to kind of map that out and not just leave it to chance or be reactive because you're, you're going to be in for a rude awakening and you don't want that. You want to experience, you know, life to its fullest at the right and appropriate times. And that's so powerful. It's so powerful. I thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. And I, I do hope you get to see your father and he gets to see your kids. Yeah. But, we just yeah. have to, we just have to make it over there. So yeah. there's, a, there's a happy ending. We will see, we will see yeah. him, but <laughs> yeah. just not in California. Yeah. <laughs> well, I totally, but I totally get that. I totally get that. Cause you know, I mean, as, as my mom gets older and we lost my dad in 2018. And I think that, you know, similar to your story, I mean, there's just, there's so much more time that I wish, you know, I had with him and, and it happened so sudden and it was, it was like one of those things where you're like, whoa, like, 
this is happening and I wasn't expecting this. Like I didn't, you know, expect that. And so now we try to see my mom and get her down here as much as possible. And, you know, I try to get up to see her as much as I can too, because in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking about that. Like we only have like 365 days. Like, oh my goodness. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like, and even when I used to live less than a mile from her and we could walk to, you know, her house, I still like didn't see her every day, you know, maybe mm-hmm. like two, three times a month. So I think about that and, and it definitely weighs on, you know, that overall. And I lo- just love, like you said, that connection, you know, the connection with her. So I think there's so many themes throughout, throughout our conversation that have just been really beautifully woven together around money and around connection and the power of that and utilizing money as a, as a tool, a resource, a vehicle to get done what you need while also building building your wealth and building you know, your future. Because, And I just think it's a subject that is becoming less and less taboo. And I love that we're even talking about it in this way because I think money used to be kind of one of those like, we don't want to talk about that. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, don't really, you don't ask people how much they make. You, know, you don't talk about that. And now it's like, you know, being in an entrepreneurial space, I'm like, well, like a lot of stuff that I do is is rooted in money because I have to get paid. I have to, yeah. I have to get paid for the work that I do. That's so, right. so I've I've gotten very, I've gotten a lot more comfortable with my own relationship with with money and asking for it as well. Yeah, that's and I right. Think there's there's power in that in and of itself. That's right. That's right. Well, and and to your point too, I think I think a lot of people think about money and in terms of like. You know, how do I make investments and how do I make my money grow? But I think in connecting it to some of the relationship things that we're talking about, I think it's also important to remember, like investing in experiences and relationships is equally, if not more important. Right. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks like, okay, I need money to do things. You don't like walking, you know, in a trail with my son, like picking up flowers and looking at bugs like that doesn't cost anything. Right. I just maybe some of my time, but it doesn't cost me anything money wise. That's an experience that he's going to hold on for the rest of his life. And those memories compounded over the years are going to create incredible just future experiences from him too. Because remember, like a lot of people think that when you do things and experience things, the value is at just that point in time. And that couldn't be further from the truth, right? Like if we had a great podcast episode, it wasn't that hour that we just talked and went back and forth. It's Oh, when your name comes up in another conversation, oh man, I remember talking to Maria about this. Oh, that was such a good podcast. And that happens thousands of times over the next 20, 30 years. The value of that experience, which again, costs us just our time, no money, was like compounded over the years, right? So I think we forget like investing experiences is so important, not just for the time, but for all the future benefits that are derived from it year after year because of the memory associated with it. Not to mention all the learnings that we have that affect everything else. It's so good. It's such good. <laughs> I love all of the, 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 just everything you're pouring, you're pouring down onto the conversation. I love it. I love it. I'm pouring into it. It's so good. Yeah. We prioritize experiences. I love that. Yeah. And leading into that, what is an experience that you are working towards having? Cause it's going to lead into my last question for you on your goal experience as far as like something that we're looking forward to or something Mm -hmm. that we're working on. We are right at the beginning of actually having a third child. Oh my gosh. Congratulations. Thank you. This is like my announcement to the world because it's like we we just passed the three months. I feel so honored. I feel so honored. You and your guests. Now everybody knows. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, we're, we're super excited. We have two boys. We've been blessed with a daughter hopefully, you know, everything goes well, but we're really excited. And that's something that I'm just really thinking about, like, well, what does life look like from going from two to three children? How do I make sure that I show up for all of my children, that they feel loved and seen, because you're going to have less time, you know, what are the different ways that I have to approach this going forward? How, how am I going to free up more time in my schedule from work to make sure that I, I spend the adequate amount of time at home raising these kids? So I'm thinking a lot. I'm yeah, thinking a lot. Yeah. I'm very, very excited. I'm very thankful. These are all good problems, but you know, that's, that's something that I'm really excited about. Oh, I'm so happy for you guys. Congratulations. That's Thank awesome. You. Yes. Thank you. We'll have to do like a little gender reveal or something. Well, you know, you said it's a girl, so we'll have to do like a little like thing, like on the, on the podcast, like when you announce it, it'll be like, yeah, let's girl. just pretend nobody knows the gender and they're like, Hey, surprise. <laughs> hey, surprise. Right. <laughs> there you go. No, I love that. I mean, we have three and it is wild. I mean, it's like next level. I always say it's like once you get past two, it's like you might as well have 12. 
And so it is like the game changes because you no longer have like, you know, one-on-one -on -one coverage with the kids. So like, you know, it's right. like you, you've got that extra, you've got that extra one that just kind of sometimes running away, you know, dangling out there. You're like, you got to go corral them, but no, but it's, but it's amazing. And I, I think the really cool thing is you get to see your other two, your two boys interact and grow up yeah. around her and oh my gosh, she's going to be the little the princess. So excited. And it's really cool. Yeah. We're just, we're really excited because it's just adding another dynamic to the family and, you know, I think it's going to be great. Yeah. That's so cool. So then the next thing is outside of that, outside of that experience, which is definitely an experience that you are working towards and you guys are building up for. I ask all of my guests this, what is your do the dang goal? It's like that burning goal. Like, you know, either, you know, personally or professionally that you're like, you know what, this year is going to be the year that I make this happen. Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, this year, outside of improving my terrible golf game, which I love, but golf hates me, it would be to getting the book out. So I, if the manuscript is finished, you know, we're just working on the aesthetics of the book, but the book's going to be coming out in a couple of months. And I'm so excited because it's been like a labor of love, a lot of revisions, a lot of time and effort, a lot of people helping. So that's, that's 2024. I've got to just get it over the finish line. We're almost there. So that's what I'm focused on. I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited for this book as well so that I can read, read it and oh, be thank you. enlightened by just your awesomeness. And, and I love the subject, the relationship recession. I mean, I think that's just fantastic to the way to put it. I mean, it, it just is. Yeah. And I feel like it also will hopefully drive us to, to build and create better relationships with others and to get out of that connection deficit and start right. to, yeah, start, start to connect more with, with each other. No, Richard Wu, you were just amazing. I'm so, so thankful that like the universe brought us together. <laughs> I consider you a friend now. I'm like, listen, I'm coming to LA. I'm going to visit my friends. We're going to, awesome. we're going to sync up like the whole thing. So, I love it. I love it. I love it. With the but crazy yeah. families together. Yes, that's right. Yes. So outside of when the book comes out, where else can people find you, follow you, learn more about the work that you do with your clients if they're interested in having that conversation about managing their own wealth. Absolutely. You can find us at our website. We're at Catalyst Planning Partners. You can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us, you, you can find me on my podcast, The Power of Connections. It's on Spotify and Apple. So a lot of mediums, reach out. If there's any way that I could be helpful, please like reach out. If I can help you, great. If I can put you in the right direction, that's fantastic too. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm glad that we're just continuing to have this conversation around how we create the vision, not just for the goals that we're working to achieve, but how we're spending our time and the connections that we're leaning into as well with the backdrop of having the money to do so. Absolutely. So, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate having you on and coming on. Thank you, Maria. It's a pleasure.